Adidas talk's going to be about kernel pointers and, and how to get them. So brief introduction about myself. Um, not that I needed one after Hugo's excellent intro. Um, so as he mentioned, I worked on React OS for a few years. Um, that was a project that was trying to, and still is trying to, recreate Windows NT in an open source fashion. Um, Windows NT, so Windows Server 1003 is the actual target kernel. That's not an easy task for a group of 10 or 20 people. Um, so it's slowly chugging along. There is zero, version 0 0.15 now. Um, so they have USB working and sound, and you know, in five years they'll have 0 0.20 out. Um, so yeah, it's, it's slow. But the good thing about it is if you've ever reverse engineered Windows, if you've ever wanted to figure out how a function looks like, there's a good chance that function, or if it's in the kernel, was already reverse engineered. So suggest you take a look if you've never heard about it. Um, so what do you do when you reverse a Windows kernel for too long? You go work at Apple, which is what I did. Um, and then I started working on the Windows internals books and, and training. Um, and I left Apple a few years ago to go work at CrowdStrike, which is a security startup in the Bay Area. Uh, some of you may have heard about it. Um, basically doing security work um, both on Windows as well as on Mac. So I get to do kernel stuff on both platforms now. Anyway, so what I'm basically going to do in this talk is a collect bunch of information leaks that some of which are public and documented by people, but kind of all over the place, um, and try to give better structure definitions and better information about what those leaks give you. So some of this is going to be taking the old stuff and then putting it all together. And the other part is going to be new things. So let's say they were going to fix all those old things, or let's say that those things would become irrelevant. What other info leaks are there? And this is probably, yep? Okay. Oh, I thought that was, a, I thought it was on purpose. <laughs> all right. So let's try that again. Oh, it's nope, still no good. Well, the default, but let me switch to it. So I'm at uh, the duplicate. I think it's PowerPoint. Is that good? Yeah. All right. Let me just duplicate it. There we go. All right. Sorry for that. Um, so, and the other part that I'm going to talk about is new APIs, other functions, other ways, uh, memory leaks. Basically, going to prove how kind of futile it is to think that um, kernel ASLR in Windows can really do anything against a local attacker because there's just so so many ways to get things out. Um, and also we'll talk about why there's so many and kind of what could someone do about that. So why am I doing this talk? Well, a few months ago I had a little Twitter statement that I think was I was trying to troll Spender, where I basically said, I know, I know of no kernel ASLR info leaks whatsoever. No one has ever found any. And Spender got really mad and basically ranted for 15 pages in a really good blog post. So it was just a troll. No, actually not. Um, the reason I wanted to give this talk was because Windows has been making a really, really good job of uh, making ASLR in user mode better and better and better and better. Um, Windows 8 and uh, the new version of Windows that's coming out, they've been adding more and more um, randomization, entropy, protection, tricks to make it harder and harder to guess or exploit user mode applications because of ASLR. In the kernel, though, th there hasn't been that level of, uh, of advancement. And partially we're going to see because of app compat, partially because there's just so much undocumented things. And so compared to, let's say, iOS or OS X, where there's been a lot of work put in to actually try to mitigate some of these info leaks, in the kernel there's just a lot of them. And I kind of wanted to put it all together just so people are aware of, here's all the things you can get for free. So some of these info leaks, some of these APIs do not need any privileges. So some of them you're going to be able to call from an unprivileged context. Others are going to be CPU instructions. Others are going to be memory regions that you can read. So a variety of these won't require any sort of privileges. So those are really good for local exploitation if you have a write what where issue. 
there's also going to be some of these that do require privilege or some sort of admin rights. And you might think, well, why is that useful? I'm already admin. I can load a driver. Well, Windows has a lot of protections to prevent arbitrary drivers from loading, to detect when drivers get loaded. They enforce signing. There's patch guard. On Surface, you cannot, on Windows RT, on ARM, you cannot load any drivers. And so there is some interest if you're looking at patch guard, DRM, code signing, ARM devices, to do admin to ring zero exploitation or attacks. The, the recent jailbreak for Surface is exactly that kind of example. It's a bug that only works if you're admin. No one cares about that. Microsoft didn't fix it for two years. But on Surface, suddenly it's a jailbreak. So there's some use to that as well. And some of the other ones I'm going to show you are not really info leaks in the sense that they give you some sort of kernel pointer that's useful for something, but they're more privacy leaks. So they'll reveal things about the system or about the user on a system that you may not know is being revealed, or as we call them these days, metadata. So there's way, way too much previous body of, 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 of research to just put it all here. Um, but your usual suspects, Tavis, Matthew, Juru, um, Tarjay, all these guys have been disparately talking about some of these things, some of them, not all of them. Um, and their blogs and their talks are always a great, great resource. So let's start with the old stuff, the stuff that some of you probably already know about. NT query system information, undocumented API um, that gives you a whole lot of information about anything you want. In fact, it has over, I think in Windows 8, over 160 different pieces of information on the system that you can query. Each of these giving you sometimes dozens of fields about each class. Now, I say undocumented because it's an NT function. But if you actually go and search for it on the internet, you will find some documentation um, for it. So if, let's see if my internet's going to be good here. So if I go and search for NT query system information, there is an MSDN page that, that warns you not to use it. And then they document seemingly some of the information classes. For those that don't know, this is from the settlement with the American government a few years ago actually almost a decade ago now, when Microsoft was being sued for being a monopoly. And companies were arguing, look, Office is, is, has access to the source code of Windows. Office can do all these things. Other competitors to Office can't do these things because they're undocumented. And so Microsoft lost or settled. And part of the settlement was they had to document all their undocumented APIs that Office was using. But Microsoft was very sly. They documented exactly how Office was using those APIs. So one of these information, so they only documented the information classes that Office was using. And then look, how was Office using these? So there's an there's information class, for example, gives you a whole bunch of information about memory look asides or about interrupts. And they tell you this structure, this, this information class is useful for generating random numbers. Because Office was taking these, this useful structure and just hashing it into a random number. And so they tell you, you should use this for random number generation. If you actually go and read the definition they give you for the structure, they tell you this structure is an array of 24 bytes that you can use for random number generation. That's not what it is. It's just that's what Office was using it for. So it is documented, um, but it's basically a, a legal sleight of hand. So the real documentation is React OS header files and people reversing it. So one of the information classes is System Module Information, or System Module Information EX. Now, this returns a type that actually most people on the internet get wrong, or they've created it by themselves. Um, I don't know why they don't use the real type. But the real type is RTL Process Module Information. And this gives you the base address, timestamp, uh, checksum, and a few other pieces of information about every loaded driver, as well as every loaded user mode image. Um, and in Windows 8, they no longer give you the user mode images but they do still give you the driver. So if you want to know the base address of the kernel, base address of the HAL, base address of any of those things, this API gives it to you, and you don't need to be uh, privileged to get that. So bam, already you have useful pointers. What if you wanted kernel objects? Things like events, mutexes, processes, etc. Well, there is another class that is the same function called system object information. This returns a structure called system object information. And this gives you the pointer to every object on the system. And it also gives you the pointer to the kernel process that actually created this object. 
So super useful, and you would get every event, semaphore, timer, session, desktop, window station. There's about 47 different objects in Windows types, and you'd get all these objects. However, there's one saving grace, so to speak. The object has to have requested this information to be kept. That's called the maintain type list. And unless you either boot in debug mode, or actually boot with a special debug flag that turns this on for everything, you won't get any information out of this API except for the objects that do turn us on. And so the, um, the object type object turns us on, so you can dump all the object types and all their pointers, but you won't actually get all the events, the mutexes, and so on without that flag. So this one's not that bad. It still leaks all the object types, but it doesn't leak everything. On the other hand, if those objects are named and applications have handles to them, there's another API that dumps you all the handles, another class. This class gives you every single handle in every process, including the kernel process, and tells you not only the handle inside that process, but also the pointer to the object. So any thread objects that, that are opened, any process objects that have opened by handle, any file objects, any registry keys, events, mutexy semaphores, and so on and so forth, if anyone has a handle to any of them, you get their pointer. And you get the handle ID as well. Now, there's actually a bug in the original information class where the handles and the PIDs were cut down to 16 bits. And so they added in Vista, the EX version, the system handle information EX, and that one gives you the full 32 bits. And that one a lot of people don't actually use, because um, unless you've got PIDs over, over 65,000, you will notice the bug, but there are actually two information classes. What if you wanted locks? Now, this one's kind of useless, I find, but it's another kernel pointer leak, and this one gives you all the uh, executive locks, which is our type of single reader, sorry, single writer, multi-reader lock in the kernel. This gives you all of those resources, and if anyone owns them, gives you the kernel pointer to the owner. So the kernel, the owner could be a little bit more interesting than the resource, and again, that gives you that type called RTL process lock, which is also, you can find it in the, in, in the headers. What about kernel stack addresses? Now, this is a little bit more interesting. Um, this, for example, can be used uh, to break stack cookies. Uh, OS 7 can be used if you have any sort of stack address that you need to get from user mode. So there's another information class called system extended process information. So not system process information, but extended. This one gives information on all the processes, and it gives information on all the threads in all the processes, including the kernel stack base and the kernel stack limit, as well as the user stack base and user stack limit. So you get all the kernel stacks, and you get the address of a tab as well in user mode if you were interested about that. And again, you don't need to be privileged to do this. So you can get any, everyone's tabs and everyone's stacks, including in the kernel. Now, here's one that actually um, is not on any papers that I've seen. This was, gives you what's called the big pool information. So the Windows has a pool manager, and which is the kernel mode heap, and there's been lots and lots of good papers about the heap. Whenever you allocate from the heap, as in any heap allocator, you get little chunks of memory. But if you allocate a large enough allocation that basically causes the pool header plus your pool allocation to be over a page, well, you actually use the big page allocator. So instead of trying to carve up four kilobytes in the heap, it actually goes in a secondary heap that's made only of big page allocations. Now, there is a non-documented information class to get all the pool allocations, but all you get is your tag. So all you're told is, here's an allocation called foobar, 120 bytes, somewhere. But if you ask for the big pool information with this information class, it'll actually give you the virtual address as well, and the tag. And there are, you know, I, I looked on my system, I had about four or 5,000 big pool allocations. So it's not something that's that rare. Anything that's going to be over four kilobytes, any, any file object buffer, any, any large uh, packet, anything, any, anything over named pipe, um, anything that's large that's going to go in the kernel heap, you're going to get its virtual address, and you're going to get its tag as well, um, which is its identifier. And Microsoft is nice enough to give you a list of all the tags in the debugger and what they're corresponding to. So you'll get access to certain kernel structures. Um, so for example, if you know that you can fill a buffer in a kernel um, with, with your own custom data, but you had always the problem that you didn't know where this buffer was going to end up being, if you can make the buffer be a big pool buffer, then you can find the buffer by using this API. Again, don't have to be privileged. So those are some of the easy API ones that some of, you know, some of them everyone knew about, others um, perhaps not. There's also some 
design issues uh, at a CPU level and, and some interesting decisions that give you some other kinds of leaks. So one example um, that's somewhat well known is segments and descriptors. So on the x86 architecture and x64 semo, we have the GDT, the Global Descriptor Table, and the IDT, the Intra Dispatch Table. The addresses of the GDT and the IDT are stored in a CPU register called the GDTR and the IDTR. And you can read that register with a CPU instruction, SGDT and SIDT, and you don't have to be privileged. So if you've got an exploit that lets you override a byte somewhere, you want to install a call gate, you want to, you want to flip a byte and an interrupt address to make it a user mode interrupt. Now that's harder in Windows 8 with SMEP, but any kinds of those attacks, you get the address of the GDT, you get the address of the IDT. On top of that, the GDT and the IDT for processor zero are actually allocated in the kernel module itself, so you also get an indication of where the kernel module is going to be. Although, with the other API, you get the exact pointer, so it doesn't matter that much. Now, you can also, on 32-bit, actually read the GDT. And the GDT has segments, um, and also has um, basically uh, what are called TSS, task, task state segments, which are another interesting structure where you have, for example, the kernel stack. So by using the um, NT query information thread API on your current thread, on 32-bit you can read the entire GDT. And the reason for that is because 32-bit Windows lets you have a local GDT that's called an LDT, and you would normally use that API to read your LDT. If you don't have an LDT, that would let you read the global one. So with that, you can, add, you can get the address of the KPCR, which is a critical structure in Windows in the kernel, because the KPCR is stored in the FS segment, going to be in the GDT, and you can read it that way. Um, so Drew, for example, talked about this trick. Now, 64-bit, because there's no LDT, you can't use this API, just won't work. Um, but you can still get the address of the GDTR and the IDTR. Now, another thing you can do on ARM, so on Windows 8 on ARM devices, is you can use the software thread ID registers. So ARM, um, when, when OSs like Linux and Windows wanted to port um, to them did not have anything like segmentation. So something like the FS segment that would always point to the tab or the GS segment in Linux that always points to the TLS information didn't exist. So they told ARM, you guys should add in the architecture some sort of set of registers or a register that we can set in the kernel and that user mode can read sometimes to replicate the fact that I can get the PCR from somewhere and I can get the tab from somewhere. And ARM did that. But interestingly, ARM added three registers. One of them that they called user read write, one of them that they called privilege read write, and one that they called user read only. And so what Microsoft does, and you can look at in the, I'll show you the header files, they store the tab in user read write, which makes sense because that's just like the FS segment on x86. So you can always get a tab address on ARM by reading that. In privilege read write, they store the KPCR, which is equivalent to the FS segment or the GS segment is in the kernel of 32 bit or 64 bit windows. But they got another one, they got a third one they got for free. And so there they actually decided to store the K thread. To get the K thread on 32 bit, you normally have to read the PCR and then the reference the K thread. And that's the current thread that's executing. On ARM, they said, well, we have a register there, let's use it. But interestingly, this register is actually user read only. So by doing the right ARM instruction, you can read on a Surface device, for example, the current K-thread address. Not that it matters that much, because we just saw a bunch of APIs where you could do that anyway. But let's say they killed all of those APIs somehow, you'd still have this. So how, do you, um, how, how can you tell this? So if you actually get the Windows 8 header, header kit um, in the include directory, you go on winnt.h. Um, they're going to have their, the intrinsic that you can use to actually read that. So I'll just show it to you so you'll know what I'm talking about. NT current. So that's NT current tab on x64. For those of you who are aware, you know, who know about the GS segment. And then you have NT current tab on ARM. So on ARM, to read those kind of registers, you use this instruction called move from coprocessor, which is um, MCR and MRC, depending if you're moving from or moving to coprocessor, that's an intrinsic that you get for free. 
And CP15 TP RURW is the definition of the coprocessor 15 register that has the tab on Windows. Um, so if I go search for it, I should find it. There you go. So basically, if you were to do MCR 15, 0, 13, 0, 2, or just use the intrinsic in Visual Studio, you would um, be able to read the current tab. And if you pass them 3, which is reader read only, then you'd be able to read the current K thread. Um, and if you look at the kernel headers in the NTDK, you'll see this one, RPRW, being used as part of KE get PCR, which would read FS on x86, it reads this register. So we have a register on ARM, just like on x86, kind of that gives us information um, uh, that we don't need to be privileged to get. We also have um, something that might be more useful if you're doing a, a, a physical RAM attack, like the one I did a syscan last year, where I had, a, I had a bug in Windows where I could modify physical memory. And I needed to know an interesting physical address to attack. Well, back in 2003 and earlier, you could map device physical memory, get the RAM address, and map that or, or scan it. They killed that feature, but they added another information class called system firmware table information. And with system firmware terminal information, you're able to request some physical addresses. You're able to request the SM BIOS tables that have things like who made your laptop, what kind of battery do you have, what kind of RAM you have, and you can request the ACPI tables. And those tables sometimes contain very useful information like EFI information, EFI functions, pointers to other uh, physical addresses. And so if you do have a write what where bug at the DMA level or the physical memory layer, Dumping the CPI tables is something you can do um, from user mode and, 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 and read those addresses. Another thing I want to talk about, but that unfortunately Drew talked about, because we always end up doing the same thing, are trap handler leaks. So when I was working on React OS, um, reversing all this, I noticed an interesting pattern that Windows sometimes uses. Most of the time in Windows, when you're in the kernel and you're touching a user mode address, you're going to build an exception frame. You're going to use try accept. You're going to use SEH to make sure that if you crash while accessing a user mode pointer, you have an exception handler that kicks you back into user mode. But there were two or three functions in a kernel, like the system call handler, actually, that when the system call handler was touching user mode memory, there was no exception handler. And now when I was reversing it and, and, and doing the code in Reactor, I was thinking, this can't be right. I mean, there can't be such a huge bug in Windows where the system call handler just touches things blindly. And then it was some code, and yeah, in Windows it wasn't crashing, in React OS it was crashing. So you know, some people are like, well, we should add an exception handler. I'm like, well, no, Windows doesn't have one. What's going on? So we started looking at the exception handler, the page fault handler in Windows. And it turns out that if you have certain exceptions on certain addresses while you're in the kernel, the page fault handler says, ah, you're in the system call handler. I'm not actually going to do a page fault. I'm not actually going to crash the machine. I will manually generate an exception as if you had an exception handler. Why do this? Because at least on x86, setting up an exception handler is expensive. You have to push stack on the front. You have to push stuff on a stack. You have to set up the exception record in, in the KPCR. And so every system call to do this on the off chance that the pointer might be invalid is not worth it. So instead, you don't set up any exception frame. You just try touching it. And in the exception handler, if they see that the one instruction they know that is at address x touch something, then they won't actually crash. So what Drew realized is, well, what if I just manually try to jump in that address, thus generating an exception at that address? Won't the kernel then think that I'm actually the system call handler? And it turns out that, yes, if you just jump to those addresses, you can cause interesting behaviors up to crashes. It also means that if you just randomly try to do things, like randomly try to touch addresses, at some you normally, you normally get a crash. But if you touch the address that's the one of the magic ones, then you'll get a special crash that will look like you're the kernel. So you can either guess the addresses if you don't know them, or if you know them, you can create interesting behaviors. So trap handlers have all these interesting hacks. And, and Drew's paper on his blog um, talks a little bit more about them. And again, this you can just do within the context of your own process. There also are a bunch of memory-based leaks. And these are mostly because of the window manager. So these are basically addresses in your address space that contain things that really they shouldn't. So win32k.sys is the window manager. 
in Windows, and also the DirectX manager, the font handler, uh, printing, all of that stuff. It has two heaps that it creates, a session heap and a desktop heap. Now, to simplify, we can think of the session heap as where the handle table of all the graphical objects are, and the desktop heap is where all those window graphical objects are actually living in. The addresses of those two things are actually given to you in user mode. So if you look at any user mode process, so let's say I'm going to attach to, uh, let's say, Explorer right here. Make sure I get the symbols. In user 32, there's an exported variable called G shared info. And thankfully, we get the public symbols for this in Windows 7. That's called tag shared info. And so in user mode, in your process, all you have to do is load user 32, go to this variable, and you'll have this structure. And this ahe list here, that's going to be the address of the session heap. Because the session heap starts with, with the um, handle entry data database. But not only do you get the address in your address space, you also get this interesting field called UL shared delta. And this tells you where, what is the offset you have to add to your user, user mode address to get the kernel mode address. So if I just add those up together, I get this pointer, which if I had actually dumped the G shared info in the kernel, would match. So I take a user mode pointer, I add the shared delta to it, that gives me a kernel address which matches exactly what the kernel address really is. So I can do yes to verify. So the kernel has the same structure with the kernel pointers. So that's how you get the session heap. Now in that, and, and we'll see what's in there. You can also get the desktop heap, which has all the actual objects. Now the desktop heap is a little bit trickier. In the tab, So in the thread environment block of a process, uh, I should probably attach to something. Let's, let's pick one of the graphical threads. So if you're a thread that, that is a GUI thread, in your tab at offset 800 on 64-bit, there's this Win32 client info, which the symbols say is just an array of, of numbers. It's not really an array of numbers. It's actually a structure. So if I take my tab address, and add 800, and dump this as what's called a tag client info, I actually get the structure, which has another UL client delta. And you'll notice this one's actually a little bit different. It's not the same client delta. This is the delta between any pointer in a desktop heap in user mode and the desktop heap in kernel mode. Now, how do I get a desktop heap? Well, right above this, there's a little pdesk info here. So if I just go ahead and dump pdesk info, which is user mode, it gives me the kernel pointer of the desktop base. And if I just subtract, subtract the desktop base from the UL client delta, that gives me the desktop heap in user mode. And also, you can note here that all these pointers are actually kernel mode pointers. So these are all objects, structures, uh, pieces of information that are in the kernel whose pointers are being leaked to me in user mode. And not just leaked, but also mapped in user mode. So any interesting information that's in any of these structures is also mapped in user mode. And the desktop heap is shared across the whole desktop. So just to show you an, an example of a privacy leak, one of the things in this, in this user mode desktop structure is a window for the shell process. So that's the window of, of the shell of Explorer. It's a kernel mode pointer. So let's, let's start by not picking it in kernel mode. So I do a DT on it. And I look at its, say, at its name. So there's a string here that contains a name, stir name. And the stir name has 
buffer. So let's dump the buffer. This makes sense in the kernel program manager, of course. Compatibility explorer is still called program manager, just like Windows 3.1. But watch what happens when I take this pointer and subtract the shared delta that I got from a tab, the UL client delta from earlier. So not the one from a G shared info, but the one from the client info, this one. That gives me a, an address in user mode. And if I go dump this address in user mode, I also see program manager. But I could have taken any other window that belonged to any other process and had that too. So in your address space, you not only have all these nice little kernel mode pointers that map the user mode, you actually have the kernel mode pointers that are mapped for everything in your desktop. So if you're using a banking app that is nice enough to have your bank account number and its window title, or if you're working on a you know, Visual Studio project for a top secret program you, you don't want to reveal the name of, anything that's in any window title is accessible by anyone else that's also on that desktop. So all the window titles are there. In fact, in the XP days, people would, because this memory was executable, people would have fun sticking window titles that were assembly code, opcodes, and then telling other windows, go run this thing. And you had a perfect executable kernel pointer and user mode pointer that you knew about. Thankfully, these days, it's not executable anymore. So other than just Windows and such, if I went, just go back for a second here to the G shared info, you also get these other structures, like the tag display info. So that's the user mode. That's the current mode one. Let me go back to the user mode one, although the, the information is really the same. Um, and if I dump the, dis the, the server info in user mode, just an, uh, another example of just how many things are, are leaky. Um, you get things like th function pointers to functions inside win 30 kdotsys So all the default 32 um, function handlers, they're all here, and these are all kernel mode addresses. So if you want to patch something, again, any kind of exploit where you have access to a mere kernel address, you have function addresses, anything you want to know here. And you also have things like, again, information leaks that are more privacy leaks in the sense that you can get the uh, time when the, the, when the last event happened, so when the last mouse move or the last key press happened, you can get the current location of the cursor. So a lot of system-wide information that, as a guest application, you shouldn't really have access to, you can get by groveling over these structures. Um, and there's, there's a lot here. On top of that, the actual handle entry database, so if you start dumping the handles, the pointer I've got in red, in user mode or in kernel mode, remember, it doesn't matter. They're all mapped. If I go to the next one, so that's going to be plus 16. You get all the handles on a system, which will give you the address of all the objects, all the windows, all the menus on a system, and you get all of their owners. With a bit of a union here. The owners are going to be either threads or processes. So you also can find all the thread addresses and all the pointer addresses on a system by simply dumping all the window objects and looking at what all their owners are. You're not going to get all the threads because some threads don't own anything, but you're going to get a lot of addresses that way. So this is really valuable for, again, giving you a whole bunch of different addresses and pieces of information. And unfortunately, on Windows 8, they took away the symbols, but the information is, is, is still there. There's one other interesting uh, ASLR issue, which is called the HAL heap. That's something I talked about at Syscan a little bit last year. So the HAL is the kind of the platform driver for Windows. Um, it's the motherboard driver that loads before anything else, hardware abstraction layer. It loads so early the memory manager isn't ready. And so when it needs to allocate virtual memory, it has to do it in a way where it knows that that memory isn't being used right now, and that it's going to know that later when the memory manager loads, the memory manager is never going to use that memory. So there's a contract across the bootloader the HAL and the kernel that says the address FFD0000 all the way to FFFFFFF minus the shared page um, is, belongs to the HAL, and the kernel will never allocate any memory there. The bootloader will never allocate any memory there, and the HAL will only allocate memory from there until it's ready to go through the pool APIs. And that's where the HAL is going to store things like ACPI tables that have caches. It's going to store things like some of its objects. And so you have a static address in the kernel that you can always use. In, um, actually, in Windows 7 and, and right up until my talk at Syscan, Windows 8 had this issue too. They fixed it. This was also executable. 
So you actually had a nice executable uh, fixed address. You still have that on Windows 7 and Vista and, and, and down level. On Windows 8, it's no longer executable, though. Um, and on Windows 8, what you have there are a lot of pointers. So if you ever have any kind of ability to read from the kernel or um, you can overwrite something in a kernel, there's a lot of interesting pointers there, including pointers for some callbacks. So um, this was something I used in my attack last year. Oh, it looks like my VM died. Let's bring it back up. I should probably disconnect from it. Oh, let's see. There we go. Um, so if I do a dump pointers at FFD 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Do I really don't really at first. There we go. So one of the things they did in Windows 8 is they made the HAL kind of have its own set of objects. So for every interrupt controller, you have an interrupt controller object. It's kind of like a C++ object. It has a V table for all of its functions. The DMA controller has an object with a vtable for all of its functions. The timer has a vtable with all of its functions. And those things are allocated so early that they have to come from the HAL heap. So in the HAL heap, you have these vtables. And so um, if you could overwrite any of these pointers, you know, for example, end of interrupt, that's something you know is going to be called very often. So as soon as you overwrite that, your code is going to get controlled, if you, if you have a way to overwrite it, obviously. Um, and then there's the ones. That, another, the one I used was the timer one. That's used when querying the current timestamp counter. So I probably skipped it already. There's lists as well, which you could corrupt. Yeah. So the one I used was the TSC query counter, which gets called almost every you know millisecond. Um, and so instant code execution. Once you can override this pointer. So those are going to be at fixed addresses in the HAL heap. FFD000. Now, other than these guys, we also have some interesting debug and tracing APIs. And these ones reveal even more. But these ones, however, do usually require some sort of privilege, some sort of admin rights, something that's going to give you access to them. And a lot of this is based around ETW, which is event tracing for Windows, and WMI, which is the Windows Manager Instrumentation. So these are traces that you can enable. And on Microsoft's website, they have this, uh, if you search for MSNT system trace, it will give you um, all the traces that you can enable. And I think I had it saved in Chrome. Yep. So event tracing MOF classes. MOF is their object format. Um, and the MOF classes for system trace are going to show you how you can trace things like ALPC messages. You can trace all disk I.O. You can trace all file I.O. You can trace image loads. You can trace object manager stuff. You can trace space faults, and a whole lot more. Now, when you start tracing these things, you're going to get, for example, if you trace process creation, it's going to give you not just the image name of the process that got created. It's actually going to give you the e-process pointer of the process. So you're going to get the kernel pointers of any process that gets created, and the physical address of the page directory. So just by starting a trace, you'll get all the CR3s, and you'll get all the e-process addresses you can do a trace on threads. You do a trace on threads, you get pretty much all the information that, I that you could get through the API, including the kernel stack address, base and limit, and the kernel, sorry, the, yeah, the kernel um, stack base, the kernel stack limit, and the kernel stack address, which again, should not be public. You can also get all the spin lock addresses. So these spin locks are commonly used kernel locks, just like in any other OS. And if you turn this trace on, every time a spin lock is acquired or released, you'll be able to see that. So you'll get all the pointers to all the spin locks, and you'll get all the pointers to the caller of the spin lock. So you'll get a whole bunch of kernel function addresses, because kernel functions are always trying to allocate uh, to release and, and um, acquire spin locks. And it'll even tell you the function was a DPC or an ISR. So if it was a deferred procedure call or an interrupt handler or just kernel code. You can also trace. Resources, again, just like the kernel locks, again, mo moderate usefulness. This is going to give you a bunch of pointers to locks. Probably not that useful, but just mentioning it. You can also get a pointer to all the I.O. packets and all the file object addresses. So if you're tracing I.O., it will give you every I.O. packet address in the kernel and every file object 
pointer that this IO is targeted to. So something else that you could uh, modify. And if you turn on page fault tracing, you're actually going to get the, per the kernel pointer of every page fault, actually user mode page fault and kernel mode page fault, and the caller that caused this page fault to happen. So if you know that some interesting function will fault if you do some interesting thing, you get the address of the kernel function and the address of the program counter. And again, these things you do have to be, have the debug privilege or the trace privilege to use them, but on something like a surface where you get no access to the kernel, this gives you a lot of valuable information as to what's going on, where the address is. Um, and you can also play some of the games that, again, Drew talked about, which is, let's say you know that a PS2 um, keyboard um, driver touches a certain address or does a certain thing for every, every press, you can use tracing to, for example, figure out what key presses are being pressed by, by looking at the page faults. And there's a lot more. You can trace DPCs and ISRs. Um, so those will give you all the handlers for interrupts. You can trace image loads, which is another way of getting all the kernel base addresses. You can turn on pool tracing. And this will actually give you not just the tag of every kernel memory allocation, but also its address. So anytime the kernel makes any memory allocation anywhere, you'll get the, the address and the, um, the tag. Plus, for all these tracing things, you can also enable kernel stack tracing. So you can actually make it so that the kernel will give you a complete stack trace of its entire, um, everything it was doing when it allocated something and where it got allocated, which can be priceless if you're trying to you know, do something like bypass um, some of the surface protections. And in Windows 8, they added some new tracing for objects. So anytime an object is duplicated, waited on, created, you'll also get the pointer of that object with these kinds of traces. Another really cool API to use is the triage dump, which is actually helpful if you're just doing development as well. So back in XP, we had this API called NT System Debug Control. And NT System Debug Control lets you basically do anything you want to the kernel. If you're admin, you had this API. You could read to the kernel anywhere, write to the kernel anywhere. You were, you were basically God. And so they stopped doing that in 2003. And they said, well, now we have DRM. We have code signing. Um, now you're going to have to load a signed driver to do kernel debugging, and you have to be booted in debug mode. So when they first did that in 2003, a lot of devs were annoyed because, let's say you had a server, and a server malfunctioned, and normally you would connect the kernel debugger to see what was going on in the kernel. Well, now you had to reboot the server in debug mode. So in Vista, they added a special undocumented flag to the system debug control API that you can still use even if you're not in debug mode. And that's called the get triage dump. And that gives you a triage dump. So what's a triage dump? A triage dump is basically as if your machine had crashed. And it basically generates a kernel dump. So it has your PCR, your PCRB, your timers, your DPCs. Except that instead of having the dump of everything, you target the triage dump to a specific process. And then you get the process uh, pointer, the thread pointer, and the complete dump of those structures. And you get a dump of all the IOs the threads had. You get a kernel stack dump. You get um, an object dump. So basically, every address that was associated with the thread or with the, or the process that you targeted gives you that information in the dump. And then it calls win32k.sys, the window manager, which dumps all of the relevant window management structures and all of its global variables. So even though you're targeting on your own process, you're going to get all of win32k's global variables which include things like the eight last key presses, um, cookie information, and a whole bunch of other things that should not be dumped. And the reason for that is because they're not actually stupid. They weren't actually trying to do that. Um, but the code in Win32k.sys says, oh, there's a few variables I want to add in the triage dump. But when you add stuff in a dump, a whole page gets added. So they add this little variable, they get the whole page. They add this little variable, they get the whole page. So Turns out there's actually a built-in tool that exercises this undocumented API to give you a triage dump. So if you actually get the Windows debugging tools, um, on, let's see if I have a command prompt open. Let's create, create one. Um, so if I go to, go to my program files, x86, Windows kits, 8.0, debuggers, x64, there's this little KDBG control app that most people use to enable or disable debugging. But if you pass in TD for triage dump, and you give it a PID, 
So let's say I want to look at, I don't know, CSRSS 656. And then a file name, CSRSS.dump. Uh-oh. Looks like my It's either dumping or freezing. Looks like it's freezing. Maybe because I have kernel debugging enabled. All right, I will reboot. Sorry for that. Demo gods were not friendly today. I'll try that again with kernel debugging disabled. Uh, sorry. But what I was going to show you was once that dump got loaded, I could see, um, I could basically start doing some kernel debugging as if I had a kernel debugger loaded. So I would be able to. Um, I'll, I'll try it with the debugger disabled, but I'd be able to look at the e-process of CSRSS, do a bank process on it, see all of its threads, look at all the e-threads, look at our kernel stack addresses, and so on and so forth. So let's see if I actually got the file at all. Nope. Okay, let's try this one more time with kernel debugging disabled. Because it probably try to do a breakpoint or something. All right, program files, x86. Windows skits, eight, debuggers. Oh, also, I'm, yes, I know why it froze. I did CSRSS, which controls the mouse and the keyboard. That was not a smart thing to do. All right, let's not do CSRSS. Let's do SMSS. Um, 348, SMSS.dump. There we go, created. Now all I have to do is launch Windbag open that crash dump. Sixty-four SMSS.dump. And it will basically behave as if I'm doing currently bugging. And say you have a the nice little bug check here. 69, 69, 69, 69. Haha. -ha. That's what they hard code. And I can start looking at a stack. And I see basically, I see that it crashed while trying, it crashed while trying to essentially do the mini dump. If I do a bank process, uh, a bank PRCB, for example, that works, a bank PCR, that one doesn't work, but I can see the PRCB, which is one of the kernel structures. So I can see all these kernel pointers here, I'd get a dump of my PRCB. I can do a bank process to see the current process, SMSS and see all of its thread structures. And I should have picked the graphical process because this one has no winter decay information. Um, but I should still be able to look at some of the graphical, some of the globals here. Uh, let's see. I don't know if it's going to work because it's not a graphical app, I think. Let's see. AD. So it, it didn't work because I didn't pick a, um, a graphics process. But if I pick a graphics process, all these globals would also work. But you can already see that my bank thread works, the bank process works, I'm getting kernel stacks. So it's a nice little API that basically is very helpful for developers if they're trying to do kernel mode debugging without having the kernel mode debugger turned on, because I just disabled it before doing this. It's also useful, again, if you're doing stuff on, on Surface or if you're trying to um, get pieces of DRM information because all these kernel pointers are, are basically given to you in this triage dump. All right, 21. Let's just reset this, sorry. Oh, resolution. Thank you. Sorry, again. Screen resolution. Okay. There we go. So that's your triage dump. Now, the other large set of interesting leaks are in what's called superfetch. So what's superfetch? 
Supervetch is basically a component inside Windows related to the memory manager that tracks your activity on the system. So it looks at your user's patterns, it looks at when you resume, when you stand by, when do you switch from one user to another, what do you launch, when do you launch it, and what do you do when you launch it, and what does that thing access on disk. So basically it builds a complete profile of what you're doing, what you're accessing, um, and all that information. So it gets access to all the file I.O., all the page faults, all the launch times, and it builds predictions using a Markov chain of what are you likely going to launch next, and when you do launch that thing, what should be the priority of the pages, so that we know how important those pages should be when we page them in, and how often should we throw them out, and how much attention should we give them. It's a really interesting thing for forensics, but the interesting thing for us is that it lives in user mode. So because it lives in user mode, that means that there must be a way for it to get all those page faults and for it to get all that useful information. And it doesn't use ETW, it doesn't use system tracing. It actually uses an undocumented API, another class in anti-query system information called system superfetch information. Now system superfetch information actually has a bunch of subclasses inside of it. So you get a structure called superfetch information, which has a superfetch information class, and this lets you mess with the priority of pages. It lets you get a trace from the system with all the page faults. It lets you get all the sources, aka all the process pointers. And it also lets you dump all the uh, page databases. And there's about 12 different subclasses. There's 20 in Windows 8, so they keep adding more. And these are not very well documented, um, but I reversed some of these and created at some point a tool. Now, the interesting thing about these is they need a version number, which is these days is 45. You need a magic password to use them. And this is not a Harry Potter spell this time. Um, but what you have to pass in is Chuck, C-H-U-K, which is probably the guy's name or who knows. Um, but if you pass in Chuck as the first parameter, then it's happy. Otherwise, you get access denied. So if you tell it you're Chuck, it's all good. What can you do with this? Well, if you dump all the sources, it gives you all the process pointers yet again. So we have like a tenth way of doing that. If you ask it for the trace before Superfetch does, you get all the page faults, who did them, so you get the same information as you would get from the ETW trace. But the real cool thing is you can actually ask it to dump the PFN database. So what's the PFN database? It's the database that contains information for every page in RAM, what is being used for, what its virtual address is, what pull tags associated with it. It's basically the gold mine of everything Windows knows about your RAM. So a few years ago, I wrote a tool called meminfo that to dump this. And then Mark from SysInternals wrote a tool called RAM Map based on the source code that displayed all this graphically. So I just want to show you what RAM Map looks like and what you can get from this. So let's see if this works. Yep. So it actually takes a while. Well, not much. So this is not more interesting if you're doing system uh, administration. It'll tell you, you know, how much memory is used for everything. Um, you know, not interesting for us at this point. What's interesting is if I go to the physical pages view, it will now let me, from user mode, without loading anything in the kernel, just by using this undocumented API, get every single physical page. What list is it on? Is it active? Is it free? Etc. What is it being used for? And depending what it's being used for, I'm going to see if this is associated with an image file with an offset in that image file, with a file name, with a process, with a virtual address, and so on and so forth. So let's actually filter. So let's say I wanted to pick a process. Let's say I wanted to look at CSRSS. Well, it's, let me make these smaller. It's going to give me every physical page that CSRSS is using and the virtual address corresponding to that physical page in CSRSS. So bam, I can do physical to virtual resolution without access to the page tables, which you would normally need in user mode. I can say, well, I know that the registry is allocated in the pool with a tag called CM25. So these are all the page pool allocations in virtual memory that have this tag. And here's where they are in RAM. So I can dump page pool allocations and non-page pool allocations as well. So these are all page pool, but if I pick the different tag, like FXLG, these are all non-page pool. So all the allocations are leaked. And I could even pick a file. And this is going to be any file 
that is cached in memory, including files I have not been using for a while. I could pick a file from one of the labs I did uh, on, my, on my training this morning. Let's see. So that's a lab, not this morning, but last this week. Um, so this physical address, I have a portion of one of the labs that we did. And if you have a file, you can also go to the file summary page tab, pick a file from here, uh, sorry, file details, pick a file from here that is interesting, like a font or a DLL or anything I might want to look at, like my own presentation right now, let's say, and see not just the file in memory, but every single offset in the file on disk and where it's currently mapped in RAM. So in the other view, I can get mapped files in virtual address space, and here I can get all the mapped files in RAM. So this is A, both useful, because if someone gets this tool on your machine, they can see files you haven't accessed for months and then get all this information and dump it. It's also neat because if we are building an attack or if we're all trying to understand what the system is doing with things like the page pool access um, or, the, or, the, or the page access or the um, process information, this gives me a lot of stuff to work with. For example, CICR, those are the code integrity certificates. Well, now I know where they all are, which I shouldn't from user mode. So really neat API um, that gives you basically a complete dump of everything you could ever want. And that's it for now. Could go on for another hour. Um, point being, there is a whole lot of stuff that is made public to user mode that shouldn't be public. Some of it across privilege boundaries, so you can say, well, you're, I have to be admin to do that. But a lot of it, as we saw initially, without having any privileges whatsoever. And so really, you think, why is Microsoft not taking this more seriously? Well, they actually do care. They care a lot. The problem is the second they try to change any of these things, developers complain or users complain. If you try to get rid of that Superfetch API, everyone who uses RAM map would complain that RAM map no longer works. If you try to get rid of the API that gives you the object addresses, well, Process Explorer wouldn't be able to do that anymore, and people use that functionality. So a lot of it is because people actually depend on those features. On Mac, Apple is a lot more, well, too bad. You shouldn't be doing that, and they just kill it. But as we know, Microsoft really loves their app compat. Now, it may be a good idea to start adding some privilege checks around some of the APIs that don't have any um, and see how that works. Um, but even, even if you do do that, when you have systems like the Surface or systems where there's DRM and the kernel and the scope signing, even privileges may not be enough. So really, there, there should start being more work towards kind of not giving you so much information in user mode. There's a reason there's a ring zero, ring three boundary, and, and it, that reason should be respected. So if you're interested in knowing some of these structures, some of these APIs, and you actually want the real definitions, one of the things we worked on at Reactor is something called the Native Development Kit, the NDK. And this is basically as, as official as you can get, undocumented header file, that instead of guessing what the fields are called and what they look like, use things like PDB information, um, asserts back in Windows 2003 actually had strings in them. So when they were looking for structure fields, you could see the strings. Um, accidental blog posts by Microsoft employees, um, private PDBs, and yes, the private PDBs for Windows 8, some of them are still on the symbol server. My class told me that yesterday um, on the public symbol server. Um, header files that sometimes end up on Windows CE, so it really tries to use as much publicly available information to build that. It doesn't use anything from source code leaks or anything from you know, weird websites. Um, Drew's blog talked a lot about some of these things in the past, and his slides at Confidence 2013 at Syscan mentioned uh, specifically the uh, trap frame stuff, which is, which is very interesting. It's how to generate trap fault errors that leak the address um, when you do that. So I recommend you take a look at those if you're interested. So any questions? see hands, so I think that's good. Am I missing anyone? Yes. automation or just how to present the information in a better way. Yeah, so I actually have a, a coworker of mine um, <coughs> called Alex Rodocha, which is working on page table visualization. And one of the things he's trying to do is basically build a, a more useful tool for actually visualizing some of this information, finding connections, and automating 
you know, you could easily write, for example, Winback script that automates the fact that pointers, that's things that start with FFFFF on 64 bits, should not be in a user mode address space. Um, so he's working on some of that, but right now there isn't really anything other than RAM map, okay. which it does a good enough job, but it, you know, it's a list, a column based. So yeah, it could be better. Um, and that's something I'll, I'll try to work with him to, to get done. Yep. That is a virtual address. Um, but what's nice about it, I mentioned it's a syscan, the HAL tries to allocate, because it's one of the first physical allocator on a system, it will get the first three physical pages on a system. And you, they usually have fixed physical addresses. Like on most systems, they're going to be 100, 100, 101, 102. So there is a bit of staticity in the physical addresses as well. But the one I showed you was a virtual address. Any other questions? Yes. Do these apply on Windows Phone 8? So um, the Win30k.sys ones don't, because Win30k.sys on phone works a lot differently. It works by rendering through directly through DirectX. Um, the kernel, though, is the same binary. And as far as I know, having looked at Surface, which is also the ARM kernel, those undocumented APIs still exist. Um, I need to double check Superfetch, because I don't think there's any Superfetch. Um, but the first ones, for example, in the slide are still there. Um, the ARM instruction to get you to K thread is still there. So some of them do apply. Others, like Win32K, says don't. Superfetch, I actually don't know if they have it on phone. I imagine they don't have it, because Superfetch is mo mainly for mechanical disks. And most phones, or all phones, don't run on mechanical drives, thankfully. Any other questions? Yeah, so for the Superfetch actually keeps all that information on disk as well. So if someone has access to the Superfetch databases, um, you, you could dump them. And basically, I do a lot of forensics. Superfetch keeps track, let's, uh, for example, of all your application launches and their timestamp in the last year. Um, and th a lot of that is in there. Now, Crosstrack, we actually try to build a tool to, to mine that and parse it. Um, but it's extremely hard, because the, the databases are really hard to parse. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of stuff that could be useful for that. Now, for anti-forensics, um, you could just wipe the prefetch directory. That's one thing. Um, in memory, I'll just finish with this. RAM map does have a, a cool option called empty. And if you empty all these things, it'll pretty much wipe anything that's cached in memory. Now, if you saw the databases on disk, the first thing Superfetch is going to do is say, ooh, memory is available. Let me put everything back in. But if you delete the databases and wipe all of this, then you will have a much cleaner system for when they're grabbing your metadata. All right, I think I'm up. Time's up, so any one last question? All right, great. Thanks for listening.